We are listening to We Need to Talk About Bryce, Courageous Conversations with Bobby Henry and Guests, a podcast where we engage in courageous conversations using Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce's 1922 pamphlet, The Story of a National Crime as Provocation. I'm Bobby Henry, and I am the host of this podcast. I am a community member of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory community. I am an assistant professor at Brock University and a PhD student in the Indigenous Studies PhD program at Trent University. For those unfamiliar with Dr. Peter H. Bryce, he was Chief Medical Officer of the Department of Indian Affairs from 1904 to 1921. During this time, he examined health conditions in residential schools and wrote yearly reports calling for changes to the way Indigenous children were treated. His reports were ignored. After retirement in 1921, Dr. Bryce felt compelled to speak more broadly and publicly on the issue and in 1922, he self-published the story of a national crime in which he directly petitioned King George V in Canadian Parliament to act on the matter of the health of Indigenous children in the conditions in residential schools. In 2022, as we record these episodes, it has been 100 years since the publication of this report. In this time, a lot has happened, a lot has changed, and a lot has stayed the same. This podcast is part of Defining Moments Canada's Bryce at 100 project, which aims to create educational resources to help educators bring this ongoing defining moment of engaging in truth and reconciliation, truth before reconciliation, into their classrooms. In each episode, we will listen to excerpts from the original report as recorded by Miles Morriso. Guests will react to what we have heard, and then I will lead an open conversation circle to discuss the context, implications, and contemporary realities connected to Bryce's report. For this special episode, we will be listening to the entirety of Miles Morrisell reading Dr. Peter H. Bryce's 1922, The Story of a National Crime, an Appeal for Justice for the Indians of Canada pamphlet. The Story of a National Crime by Peter Henderson Bryce, M.A., M.D. Being an appeal for justice to the Indians of Canada, the wards of the nation, our allies in the Revolutionary War, our brothers-in-arms in the Great War, Published by James Hope and Sons Limited, Ottawa, Canada, 1922, price 35 cents. The story of a national crime being a record of the health conditions of the Indians of Canada from 1904 to 1921 by Dr. P. H. Bryce, M.A., M.D., Chief Medical Officer of the Indian Department. 1. By order and counsel dated January 22, 1904, the writer was appointed medical inspector to the Department of the Interior and of Indian Affairs and was entrusted with the health interests of the Indians of Canada. The order and council recites, The undersigned has the honor to report that there is urgent necessity for the appointment of a medical inspector to represent the Department of the Interior and Department of Indian Affairs. The undersigned believes that the qualifications for the position above mentioned are possessed in an eminent degree by Mr. Peter Henderson Bryce, M.D., at present and for a number of years past Secretary for the Provincial Board of Health of Ontario and who has had large experience in connection with the public health of the province. Signed, Clifford Sifton, Minister of the Interior and Superintendent General of Indian Affairs. For the first months, after the writer's appointment, he was much engaged in organizing the medical inspection of immigrants at the seaports. But he had early began the systematic collection of health statistics of the several hundred Indian bands scattered over Canada. For each year up to 1914, he wrote an annual report on the health of the Indians published in the departmental report, and on the instructions from the minister made in 1907, a special inspection of 35 Indian schools in three prairie provinces. This report was published separately, but the recommendations in the report were never published and the public knows nothing of them. It contained a brief history of the origins of the Indian schools, of the sanitary condition of the schools, and statistics of the health of the pupils during the 15 years of their existence. Regarding the health of the pupils, the report states that 24% of all the pupils which had being in the schools were known to be dead, while one school on the File Hills Reserve, which gave a complete return to date, 75% were dead at the end of the 16 years since the school opened. Briefly, the recommendations urged, one, 
greater school facilities since only 30% of the children of school age were in attendance. Two, that boarding schools with farms attached be established near the home reserves of the pupils. Three, that the government undertake the complete maintenance and control of the schools since it had promised by treaty to ensure such. And further, it was recommended that as the Indians grow in wealth and intelligence, they should pay at least part of the costs from their own funds. Four, that the school studies be those of the curricula of the several provinces in which the schools are situated, since it was assumed that as the bands would soon become enfranchised and become citizens of the province, they would enter into the common life and duties of a Canadian community. Five, that in view of the historical and sentimental relations between the Indian schools and the Christian churches, the report recommended that the department provide for the management of the schools through a board of trustees, one appointed from each church and approved by the minister of the department. Such a board would have its secretary in the department, but would hold regular meetings, establish qualifications for the teachers, and oversee the appointments as well as the control of the schools. Six, that continuation schools be arranged for on the school farms and that instruction methods similar to those on the File Hill Farms colony be developed. Seven, that the health interests of the pupils be guarded by a proper medical inspection and that the local physicians be encouraged through the provision at each school of fresh air methods in the care and treatment of cases of tuberculosis. Two, the annual medical reports from year to year made reference to the unsatisfactory health of the pupils, while different local medical officers urged greater action in view of the results of their experience from year to year. As a result of one such report, the minister instructed the writer in 1909 to investigate the health of the children in the schools of the Calgary district in a letter containing the following. As it is necessary that these residential schools should be filled with a healthy class of pupils in order that the expenditure on Indian education may not be rendered entirely nugatory, it seems desirable that you should go over the same ground as Dr. Lafferty and check his inspection. These instructions were encouraging and the writer gladly undertook the work of examining with Dr. J.D. Lafferty the 243 children of eight schools in Alberta with the following results. A. Tuberculosis was present equally in children at every age. B. In no instance was a child awaiting admission to school found free from tuberculosis. Hence, it was plain that infection was got in the home primarily. C. The disease showed an excessive mortality in the pupils between 5 and 10 years of age. D. The 10,000 children of school age demanded the same attention as the 1,000 children coming up each year and entering the schools annually. The recommendations made in this report on much the same lines as those made in the report of 1907 followed the examination of the 243 children, but owing to the active opposition of Mr. Duncan Campbell Scott and his advice to the then Deputy Minister, no action was taken by the Department to give effect to the recommendations made. This, too, was in spite of the opinion of Professor George Adami, pathologist of McGill University, in reply to a letter of the deputy minister asking his opinion regarding the management and conduct of the Indian schools. Professor Adami had, with the writer, examined the children in one of the largest schools and was fully informed as to the actual situation. He stated that it was only after the earnest solicitation of Mr. Duncan Campbell Scott that the whole matter of Dr. Bryce's report was prevented from becoming a matter of critical discussion at the annual meeting of the National Tuberculosis Association in 1910, of which he was then president. And this was only due to Mr. Scott's distinct promise that the department would take adequate action along the lines of the report. Professor Adami stated in his letter to the deputy minister, It was a revelation to me to find tuberculosis prevailing in such an extent amongst these children and as many of them were only suffering from the early incipient form of the disease, though practically everyone was affected, then under care it may be arrested. I was greatly impressed with the responsibility of the government in dealing with these children. I can assure you my only motive is a great sympathy for these children who are wards of the government and cannot be protected themselves from the ravages of this disease. 3. In reviewing his correspondence, the writer finds a personal letter written by him to the minister dated March 16, 1911, 
following an official letter regarding the inaction of the department with regard to the recommendations of the report. This letter refers to the most positive promises of Mr. D.C. Scott that the department would at once take steps to put the suggestions contained in the report into effect. The letter further says, It is now over nine months since these occurrences and I have not received a single communication with reference to carrying out their suggestions of our report. Am I wrong in assuming that the vanity of Mr. Duncan Campbell Scott growing out of his success at manipulating the mental activities of Mr. Pedley has led him to the fatal deception of supposing that his cleverness will be equal to that of Prospero in calming any storm that may blow up from a tuberculosis association or anywhere else, since he knows that should he fall, he has through memoranda on file placed the responsibility on Mr. Pedley and yourself. In this particular matter, he is counting upon the ignorance and indifference of the public to the fate of the Indians. But with the awakening of the health conscience of the people, we are now seeing on every hand, I feel certain that serious trouble will come out of the departmental inertia, and I am not personally disposed to have any blame fall upon me. It will then be understood with what pleasure the writer hailed the appointment of Dr. W. A. Roche as Superintendent General of Indian Affairs after the year's term of the Honorable R. Rogers, whose chief activity was the investigation of the deputy minister, which led up to his retirement. Now at last, he said, a medical minister exists who would understand the situation as relates to the health of the Indians. So an early opportunity was taken to set forth in a memorandum to Dr. Roche dated December 9, 1912, data and statistics related to the several hundred scattered bands on whose health the total expenditure was but little more than $2 per capita, while the death rate in many of the bands was as high as 40 per thousand. The reply acknowledging receipt of this memorandum contained the following. There is certainly something in your suggestion that should meet with every consideration, and some time when I can find an opportunity, and it is convenient for you, I shall be pleased to discuss this matter with you. As Dr. Roche became ill and was absent for some months, nothing further was done. But on his return, the writer, in personal interview, urged that this serious medical Indian problem be taken up in earnest. It was stated that medical science now knows just what to do and what was necessary was to put our knowledge into practice. Dr. Roche stated on his return from the West he would certainly take the matter up. Since that moment, however, to the present, the matter has awaited the promised action. The writer has done no regular inspection work since Mr. D. C. Scott was made Deputy Minister in 1913, but had, in each year up to 1914, prepared his medical report, printed in the annual report of the department. About this time, the following letter was received. P. H. Bryce, M.D., Medical Inspector, Immigration Branch, Ottawa, June 17, 1914. Dear Sir, In reply to your letter, of the first instant asking that the files of the department containing our medical officer's report be placed at your disposal so that you may peruse them to enable you to furnish a report for your publication, I desire to point out that by organization of this department under Civil Service Act of 1908, you were not included therein, and since that time your whole salary has been a charge against the Department of the Interior. It is true that since we have availed ourselves of your services on a few occasions, but during the past year, so far as I am aware, you have not been called upon to do any duty for the department. I may say also that Dr. Grain of Winnipeg has lately been appointed to oversee the Western schools and reserves, and his time is fully occupied in the work. Under these circumstances, I do not think that you should be asked to furnish a report on the medical work in connection with Indians during the fiscal year. I must thank you cordially for the offer to again prepare a report for publication. Yours sincerely, Duncan C. Scott, DSGIA. The transparent hypocrisy contained in this remarkable communication sent not by the minister, Dr. W. A. Roche, but by his deputy, will be seen in the fact that from 1908, five annual reports have been prepared by the writer 
While the special report on the eight schools of the Calgary District with the recommendations already referred to have been made on the instructions of the department in 1909. The other reason given to the effect that a certain physician, since retired for good cause, quite inexperienced in dealing with Indian disease problems, had been appointed as medical inspector for the western provinces, showing how little the minister cared for the solution of the tuberculosis problem. As a matter of fact, the order in council appointing the writer had neither been changed nor rescinded, while the transfer to the Interior Department of the payment of the total salary was made in 1908 in order that his regular increase of pay under the new classification of the Civil Services Act of that year might be made. 4. As the war broke out in 1914 and immigration was largely suspended, an unexpected opportunity occurred through the greater time at his disposal for the writer's special knowledge and experience to be utilized in proving the health of the Indians. But in no single instance thereafter were the services of the writer utilized by this medical minister, who in 1917 was transferred to preside over the Civil Service Commission, and who must be held responsible for the neglect of what proved to be a very serious situation. In 1917, the writer prepared at the request of the Conservation Commission a pamphlet on the conservation of the manpower in Canada, which dealt with the broad problem of health which so vitally affected the manpower of a nation. The large demand for this pamphlet led to the preparation of a similar study on the conservation of the manpower of the Indian population of Canada, which had already supplied over 2,000 volunteer soldiers for the empire. For obvious reasons, this memorandum was not published, but was placed in the hands of a minister of the crown in 1918 in order that all the facts might be made known to the government. This memorandum began by pointing out that in 1916, 4,862,303 acres were included in the Indian reserves and that 73,716 acres were then under cultivation that while the total per capita income for farm crops in that year in all of Canada was $110, that from the Indian reserves was $69, and that only $40 for Nova Scotia. It is thus obvious that from the lowest standard of wealth producers, the Indian population of Canada was already a matter of much importance to the state. From the statistics given in the Manpower pamphlet, it was made plain that instead of the normal increase in the Indian population being 1.5% per annum as given for the white population, there had been between 1904 and 1917 an actual decrease in the Indian population in the age period over 20 years of 1,639 persons, whereas a normal increase would have added 20,000 population in the 13 years. The comparison showed that the loss was almost wholly due to a high death rate, since, though incomplete, the Indian birth rate was 27 per thousand or higher than the average for the whole white population. The memorandum states, as the Indian people are unusually strong native race, their children at birth are large and sturdy and under good sanitary conditions have a low mortality. Thus, of the 134 children born in the file Hills Farm Colony in 17 years, only 34 died, while of 15 births in 1916, only one died, giving the unusually low rate of 77 per thousand within the year. As it was further desirable to obtain the latest returns of deaths by age periods and causes, the writer communicated with the Secretary of the Indian Department asking for such returns. In reply, he received the following letter. Dr. Peter Bryce, Ottawa, May 7th, 1918. I have your letter of the third instant asking for certain vital statistics. I am unable to give you these figures you ask as we are not receiving any vital statistics now. And last year, we obtained only the total number of births and deaths from each agency. They were not printed and are not therefore available for distribution. The causes of death have never been noted in our reports and we have no information. Your obedient servant, signed J.D. McLean, Assistant, Deputy, and Secretary. Thus, after more than 100 years of an organized Department of Indian Affairs in Canada, 
Though the writer had at once began in 1904 on his appointment the regular collection of statistics of diseases and deaths from the several Indian bands, he was officially informed that in a department with 287 paid medical officers, due to the direct reactionary influence of the former accountant and present deputy minister, no means exist, such as is looked upon as elementary in any health department today, by which the public or the Indian themselves can learn anything definite as to the actual vital conditions amongst these wards of the nation. A study of the 1916-17 statistics show that in the wage-earning period of life from 21 to 65 years, the Indians of Alberta had 161 less population, of British Columbia, 901 less, of Ontario, 991 less, and of Nova Scotia, 399 less. In order, however, to show how an Indian population may increase, the writer obtained from Mr. W. M. Graham, at that time superintendent of the File Hills Colony from 1901 to 1917, the complete record for this period. In all, there were 53 colonists from the neighboring Indian schools, starting with five in 1901 who had taken up homesteads in the colony. Most of them married, although 15 either left or had died previous to marriage. In June 1917, there were residents, 38 men, 26 women, and 106 children, or 170 colonists in all. Those we have the picture of a young Indian population of 49 males who remained in the colony, of whom 10 died of tuberculosis after an average sickness there of 2.7 years, and of 29 females of whom 3 died and to whom had been born in all 134 children. In 1916, the colony had 3,991 acres under cultivation or over 100 acres per farmer. This was one-nineteenth of the total area cultivated by 105,000 persons in all the Indian bands in Canada. While 87,498 bushels of grain were grown and 33,052 head of livestock were kept, that this variation from the normal is viewed as an anomaly may be judged by the following extract from the Deputy Minister's Annual Report of 1917. The Indian population does not vary much from year to year. How misleading this statement is may be judged from the fact that between 1906 and 1917, in the age periods over 20 years in every province but two, the Indians had decreased in population by a total of 2,632 deaths. Naturally, it is asked why this decrease should have taken place. In 1906, the report of the chief medical officer shows that statistics collected from the 99 local medical officers having the care of the population of 70,000 gave a total of 3,169 cases of tuberculosis, or one case for every seven, and a total of 23,109 diseases reported, and the death rates in several large bands were 81.8, 82.6, and in a third, 86.4 per thousand. While the ordinary death rate for 115,000 in the city of Hamilton was 10.6 in 1921. What these figures disclose has been made more plain year by year, namely that tuberculosis contracted in infancy creates diseases of the brain, joints, bones, and to a less degree of the lungs, and also that, if not fatal till adolescence, it then usually progresses rapidly to a fatal termination in consumption of the lungs. The memorandum prepared by the writer in 1918 further showed that the city of Hamilton, with a population greater than the total Indian population, had reduced the death rate from tuberculosis in the same period, from 1904 to 1917, by nearly 75% having in 1916 actually only 68 deaths. The memorandum further states, if a similar method had been introduced amongst the bands on the health-giving uplands of Alberta, much might have been done to prevent such a splendid race of warriors as the Blackfeet from decreasing from 842 in 1904 to 726 in 1916, or allowing for natural increase and actual loss of 40%, since they should have numbered at least 1,011. 5. Such, then, is the situation made known to Honorable N. W. Rowell, who applied to the writer in 1918 to supply him with such facts and arguments 
as would support the bill he proposed to introduce into Parliament for the creation of a Federal Department of Health. It was with pleasure that the memorandum dealing with Indian health matters was given to him, along with a proposed bill for a Department of Health, which contained amongst its provisions one for including the Indian Medical Service along with the other medical federal services in the new department. In this special medical committee called by Mr. Rao to discuss the bill, such inclusion was of course approved of and the clause appeared in the first reading in Parliament. But something then happened. What special occult influences came into action may be imagined. When the second reading of the bill took place, with this clause regarding the Indian Medical Services omitted, it has been noted that from 1913 up to the time when Dr. W. A. Roche was eliminated from the government in 1917 to make room for a more hearty and subtle representative of unionism, the activities of the chief medical inspector of the Indian Department had in practice ceased. Yet now he was to see as the outcome of all this health legislation for which he had been struggling for years the failure of one of his special health dreams which he had hoped to see realized. If the writer had been much disturbed by the incapacity or inertia of the medical minister in the matter of the Indian health situation, he now saw that it was hopeless to expect any improvement in it when the new minister of health who had posed as the Bayard of social uplift, the protagonist of prohibition, the champion of oppressed labor, the Sir Galahad of women's rights, and the preux chevalier of Canadian nationalism could with all accumulated facts and statistics before him condemn to further indefinite suffering and neglect these wards of the Canadian people whom one government after another had made treaties with and whom deputies and officials had sworn to assist and protect. A sidelight, however, may serve to illumine the beclouded situation. With the formation of the Unionist government, the usual shuffle of portfolios was made, and the then dominating Solicitor General, grown callous and hardened over a franchise bill, which disenfranchised many thousands of his fellow native born citizens, had now become Minister of the Interior. That the desire for power and for the control appointments should override any higher consideration, such as saving the lives of the Indians, must be inferred from the following statement of the Honorable A. Meehan, Minister of the Interior and now Prime Minister. On June 8, 1920, the estimates of the Indian Department were under consideration in Parliament. Page 3275 of Hansard has the following. Mr. D. D. McKenzie, I understand that frightful ravages are being made amongst the Indians by tuberculosis, and the conditions of life are certainly not such as to preserve them from the ravages of that dread disease. I should be pleased to know at the earliest possible moment if that branch of the Department was going to be transferred to the Department of Health. Mr. Meehan, the Health Department has no power to take over the matter of the health of the Indians. That is not included in the Act establishing the Department. It was purposely left out of the Act. I did not then think and do not think yet that it would be practicable for the Health Department to do that work because they would require to duplicate the organization away in the remote regions where Indian reserves are and there would be established a sort of divided control and authority over the Indians. Mr. Beeland. Is tuberculosis increasing or decreasing amongst the Indians? Mr. Meehan, I'm afraid I cannot give a very encouraging answer to the question. We are not convinced that it is increasing, but it is not decreasing. In this reply of the minister, we see fully illustrated the dominating influence stimulated by the reactionary deputy minister which prevents even the simplest effective efforts to deal with the health problems of the Indians along modern scientific lines. To say that confusion would arise if the equivalent of saying that cooperation between persons toward a desired social end is impracticable, whereas cooperation between provincial and federal health departments is the basis upon which real progress is being made, while further a world peace is being made possible in a league of once discordant nations. The Premier has frankly said he can give no encouraging answer to Dr. Beelan's question 
while at the same moment he condemns the Indians to their fate by a pitiable confession of utter official helplessness and lack of initiative based upon a cynical non possumus Thus we find a sum of only $10,000 has been annually placed in the estimates to control tuberculosis among 105,000 Indians scattered over Canada in over 300 bands, while the city of Ottawa, with about the same population and having three general hospitals, spent thereon $342,860.54 in 1919, of which $33,364.70 is devoted to tuberculosis patients alone. The many difficulties of our problem amongst the Indians have been frequently pointed out, but the means to cope with these have always been made plain. It can only be said that any cruder or weaker arguments by a Prime Minister holding the position of responsibility to these treaty wards of Canada could hardly be conceived. As such, recall the satirical jibe of Voltaire regarding the Treaty of Shack Maxon between William Penn and the Indians, which he described as the only known treaty between savages and Christians that was never sworn to and never broken. The degree and extent of this criminal disregard for the treaty pledges to guard the welfare of the Indian wards of the nation may be gauged from the facts once more brought out at the meeting of the National Tuberculosis Association at its annual meeting held in Ottawa on March 17, 1922. The superintendent of the Kwa'apel Sanatorium, Saskatchewan, gave there the results of a special study of 1,575 children of school age in which advantage was taken of the most modern scientific methods. Of these, 175 were Indian children, and it is very remarkable that the fact given that some 93% of these showed evidence of tuberculosis infection coincides completely with the work done by Dr. Lafferty and the writer in the Alberta Indian Schools in 1909. It is indeed pitiable that during the 13 years since then, this trail of disease and death has gone on almost unchecked by any serious effort on part of the Department of Indian Affairs, placed by the BNA Act especially in charge of our Indian population, and that a provincial tuberculosis commission now considers it to be its duty to publish the facts regarding these children living within its own province. Epilogue. This story should have been written years ago and then given to the public, but in my oath of office as a civil servant, swore that without authority on that behalf I shall not disclose or make known any matter or thing which comes to my knowledge by reason of my employment as Chief Medical Inspector of Indian Affairs. Today I am free to speak, having been retired from the civil service, and so am in a position to write the sequel to the story. It has already been stated in 1918 and 1919 I had supplied to my then Minister of Immigration, the Honorable J. A. Calder, and to then President of the Council, the Honorable N. W. Rowell, various memorandum regarding the establishment of a Federal Department of Health, amongst these being a draft of the bill which later became the Act establishing the Department of Health. To my disappointment, the position of Deputy Minister of Health to which I had a right to aspire after 22 years as Chief Medical Officer of Ontario and 15 years as Chief Medical Officer of Immigration and Indian Affairs was given to another, wholly outside the Federal Service Service and in violation of the principle of promotion which was supposed to prevail when the patronage system was to be done away with. The excuse was on the ground of my advancing years, although at that moment... The position of Auditor General was being filled by the promotion of one who had reached 65 years, while a historian to the militia department was appointed at a salary of 7000 per year, who likewise had reached just then this age. Naturally, I felt that it would be impossible to carry on and retain my self-respect as a subordinate while performing the duties which I had been engaged in for 15 years as Chief Medical Officer, and so asked that I be given other congenial work. That my claims to the position were deemed reasonable may be judged from the following letter addressed to my brother, Reverend Professor Bryce D.D. of Winnipeg. Writing from Victoria, B.C. on March 9, 1920 to myself, he said, quoting from a letter received from the Honorable Mr. Calder in reply to one of his own. I quite appreciate the views of your brother in reference to his situation here, 
and personally would be only too glad to do anything I can to help out. When the Public Health Department was created, your brother certainly had claims to the appointment as Deputy Minister. Owing to his advanced age, however, Council finally concluded that a younger man should receive the appointment. The government has on several occasions considered the question of placing your brother in some other branch of the service, and I have no doubt that this will be arranged in some way or other shortly. He is now an official of the Public Health Department. He could, of course, remain there, but this apparently is not agreeable to him. As a consequence, some other arrangement, if possible, must be made. Signed, J.A. Calder. My indignation at subsequent treatment may be imagined when the same Mr. Calder introduced the Act in 1920, commonly known as the Calder Act, providing for the retirement of certain members of the civil service. This Act states that anyone retired thereunder shall receive one-sixtieth of his salary for each year of service. So it came about that on 17 September 1920, I received notice that I was recommended for retirement under this Act. The clause of the Act quoted from my information states, Section 2.3. When it is decided to retire anyone under the provisions of this Act, notice in writing given the reasons for such retirement shall be sent to such person, and he shall have the right to appeal to the Civil Service Commission. And the Commission, after giving such person an opportunity to be heard, shall make full report to the Governor and Council, and the decision of the Council therein shall be final. I appealed, and in my appeal stated that no reason was assigned as provided in the Act, and further that I was still Chief Medical Officer in the Department of Indian Affairs as set out in Order of Council of 1904. As bearing on this point was made in my appeal, I find the following in Hansard of June 8, 1921. The matter being dealt with is the amendment to the Calder Act. Mr. Fielding. But cases have been brought to my attention of men in advanced years, some may think them old, I do not, be notified of their retirement, although they are blessed with good health and strength, both mental and physical, and are well able to discharge their duties. How is such a man dealt with? Mr. Calder, no man shall be notified unless a proper official has advised that his condition of life is such that in the public interest he should be retired. Mr. Calder, that, in the main, has been the practice in the past, and that is what the law contemplated last year. The question of age alone was not taken into consideration. But it was hardly supposed to be Dr. W. A. Roche, now chairman of the Civil Service Commission, who, during the years of 1913-17 referred to, had failed to utilize my services when he was superintendent of Indian Affairs, would now consider my services as necessary in that department. So my protest was of no avail. My elimination from the service had been decreed, and I received the following order in council. Ottawa, 14th February, 1921. The committee have had before them a report dated February 1st, 1921, from the Acting Secretary of State from the Civil Service Commission. In accordance with the provisions of Cap 67, 10 to 11, George V, an act to provide for the retirement of certain members of the public service. The Civil Service has to report that Dr. P. H. Bryce of the Department of Health at Ottawa was recommended by the Deputy Minister of Health for retirement, that under Section 2.3 of the said act he was given a personal hearing, which has resulted in the Civil Service Commission now recommending that his appeal be not allowed, but that his retirement be made effective from the 1st of March, 1921. Dr. Bryce was born on August 17, 1853, and is consequently 67 years of age. He was appointed temporarily to the service on February 1, 1904, and was made permanent on September 1, 1908, and therefore he will have been in the service 17 years and one month on 1st March 1921, the date upon which his retirement is proposed to be effective. So it came about that I was retired in March 1921, without any years being added to my term of federal service, though I had been brought to Ottawa as an expert after 22 years in the Ontario Health Service and as provided for in the Superannuation Act of 1870. Neither did I get any gratuity on leaving the Ontario Service after 22 years, the excuse being then given that I was improving my position. The irony and injustice of this order in council will be seen when it is stated that a similar order was passed on May 18, 1921, 
retiring 231 persons from the Customs Department as being over 65 years of age, but which was recalled when the protests of many friends of men who were faithfully performing their duties were made. These and hundreds of other civil servants of similar age are in different departments still performing their duties. In view, therefore, of all the facts herein recited, I make my appeal for simple justice, that I be permitted to carry on my work as Chief Medical Officer of Indian Affairs, and I believe that I have the right to demand, after a thorough investigation of all the facts of the case, that the chief obstacle as set forth in the story to ensuring the health and prosperity of the 100,000 Indians, the wards of the nation, be removed. Since the time of Edward I, the people have ever exercised their historic right to lay their petitions before the King and Parliament. I now desire herein respectfully to bring my appeal for the Indians of Canada before the King's representative and the Parliament of Canada, feeling sure that justice will be done both to them and to myself. Peter Henderson Bryce This was a reading of The Story of a National Crime by Peter Henderson Bryce, being an appeal for justice to the Indians of Canada, as read in 2022 by Miles Morso in partnership with the Finding Moments Canada, the 100th anniversary of the publication of A National Crime in 1922. And hearing Miles read The Story of a National Crime as part of Defining Moments Canada's Bryce at 100 project earmarks the power of storytelling in contemporary times. Reading a pamphlet itself is challenging, but hearing another person read aloud Bryce's words over a hundred years later is moving and transformative. As you continue listening to We Need to Talk About Bryce, know that learning a truth on Canada's policy of assimilation is challenging. In fact, it can render us speechless or feeling immobilized. However, we cannot remain in these spaces of inaction. Instead, act on your learning for knowledge and action work in tandem with one another. You can take action through sharing pieces of Miles' words with friends, colleagues, and family members. Until next time, we look forward to having you join our upcoming episode on Indigenous Health and Wellness. Thank you for tuning in and have a good day.